You are listening to North America's premier amateur radio news magazine and bulletin service of the air. This is This Week in Amateur Radio, now in our 23rd year of serving the amateur radio community. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1200 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The following is a QST. Amateur radio in the Ukraine is ordered off the air in a wide-reaching declaration of emergency. Amateurs in Poland, meanwhile, offer wind link availability to amateurs in the Ukraine. AWRL section manager election results are announced, and Virginia gets a new section manager in the latest balloting. We will bring you all of the results. The FCC reissues a previous warning about using radio transmitting equipment to facilitate criminal acts. The AWRL Board of Directors elect new officers and executive committee members. We will have all of the results for you. A new digital emergency voice network is in the planning stages in the state of Maine. Cutting edge technology was on display during the just concluded Orlando Hamcation. We will tell you all about it. Eris is seeking host for ham radio contacts with the space station crew. And amateurs in Australia are preparing for a lot of mayhem. We will tell you all about it in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about how Windows 11 will now require a Microsoft account to use the operating system. He will tell us how Google is following Apple and announcing new privacy features for Android. The National Traffic Safety Administration is considering allowing adaptive headlight technology for new cars. And he will tell us how a software startup in France has a new app that identifies cheese. Australia's own Anno Benshop, VK6FLAB, will tell us his version of how to compare radios. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill will take a snapshot of amateur radio as it existed in 1962. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will tell us how to climb your tower and avoid the sudden stop. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, this Week in Amateur Radio takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from my home studio in Cortlandville, New York, this is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, Along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our radio outpost in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where mud season has re-arrived, but the sap is flowing too, so we're happy. I am Don Ulick, K2ATJ. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, located in sunny Central Florida, I'm Fred, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where old man winner isn't done with us yet, I'm Eric, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we're digging out from under some ice one day, and another day we're hitting temperatures in the 60s. I guess winter and spring are having a battle. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off this week's newscast, a state of emergency was declared in Ukraine just prior to the Russian military invasion, except for eastern Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts, starting on February 24th. The parliament approved the decree introduced by President Volodymyr Zelensky on February 23rd, as the threat of Russia's all-out invasion of Ukraine continues to grow. The International Amateur Radio Union was monitoring the events. Greg Mossop, G0DUB, IARU Region 1's Emergency Communications Coordinator, said the events in Ukraine are obviously fast-moving, and although there were early reports of telecommunications failures, it appears these may have been due to the volume of calls on the networks. 
Webcams in the area are functioning, and people do seem to be able to make calls. Sadly, the Ukrainian National Society has reported that a ban on the operation of amateur stations in Ukraine has been put in place for 30 days, commencing February 24th. IARU Region 1 and its member societies are monitoring the situation closely, but remind all amateur radio operators they must follow their national laws and regulations. The Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts already have a special legal status because of Russia's ongoing occupation since 2014. Among other things, the state of emergency allows the authorities to temporarily limit the public's constitutional rights. As published on the website of the Verkhovna Rada, Ukraine's unicameral legislative body, the state of emergency includes regulation of TV and radio activities and a ban on the operation of amateur radio transmitters for personal and collective use. The decree also imposes a ban on mass events and on strikes, and authorizes checking the documents of citizens and, if necessary, conducting searches on persons, vehicles, cargo, office space, and housing. A curfew could also be imposed. The U.S. news website Politico quoted Oleksiy Danilov, Secretary of Ukraine's National Security and Defense Council, describing the actions as preventative measures to keep calm in the country. Members of Poland's National Amateur Radio Society, the PZK, are now providing Winlink email communications in the 1.8, 3.5 and 14 MHz bands. Winlink is an amateur radio-based email system which interfaces with your usual email program on your computer. The PZK said that in the face of the latest threats in the region and a possibility of an incoming wave of refugees with over 2 million already living in Poland, they would like to remind radio hams in Ukraine that they are at their disposal. Speaking directly to Ukrainian radio hams, the PZK said that if you're a licensed amateur radio operator, you can send information by email to your relatives in Poland or to the emergency services via the Winlink radio system, which works on the HF bands, independently of access to the local internet infrastructure. Amateurs are advised to download the software from winlink.org forward slash Winlink Express, installing it and checking its operation. Polish Winlink nodes are now operational in the 160, 80 and 20 meter amateur bands. Station Sierra Romeo 5 Whiskey Lima Kilo is on a dial frequency of 3595.5 kHz upper sideband. Sierra Romeo 3 Whiskey Lima Kilo is on 14111 kHz upper sideband. And Sierra Papa 3 India Echo Whiskey is set up on dial frequency 1865 kHz upper sideband. If the Polish society receives information about the failure of the internet in the regions in danger, a speech-based station will be operational daily. Sierra Papa Zero Mike Alpha Sierra Romeo will be on between 18 and 20 hours UTC on the frequencies 3770 kHz and 7110 kHz plus or minus interference. Ukrainian amateurs are asked to communicate in Polish or English. You can find out more about this operation on the PZK Facebook page. And if you're not involved in the operation, please keep well out of the way of the frequencies mentioned. Two ARRL section manager elections were held during the winter season, and the ballots were counted at ARRL headquarters on Tuesday, February 22nd. In Virginia, Jack R. Smith, KE4LWT, of Ruckersville, received 889 votes, and Terry Buzzard, KA8TNF of Virginia Beach, received 412 votes. Smith was declared elected and will begin his first two-year term on April 1st. Smith has served as an assistant section emergency coordinator for the last two years. He will take the reins of the Virginia Field Organization from Carl Clements, W4CAC. Clements was appointed in mid-December 2021 as interim section manager after the untimely and unfortunate death of section manager Joe Palsa, K3WRY. In North Carolina, Marvin Hoffman, WA4NC of Boone, the incumbent section manager, received 1,235 votes and Tony Jones, N4ATJ of McAdenville received 257 votes. Hoffman was declared re-elected and will begin his second term on April 1, 2022. These incumbent section managers faced no opposition 
and were declared re-elected and will begin new terms on April 1st. George Miller, W3GWM in Eastern Pennsylvania, John Fritz, K2QY in Eastern New York, John Mark Robertson, K5JMR in Louisiana, Joe Speroni, AH0A in the Pacific section, Dave Kaltenborn, N8BKC in San Diego, and Chris Stallcamp, KI0D in South Dakota. The Federal Communications Commission Enforcement Bureau on February 24th has reissued an earlier enforcement advisory that licensees in the amateur radio service, as well as licensees and operators in the personal radio services, are prohibited from using radios in those services to commit or facilitate criminal acts. Yes, you heard this before, and no reason was given by the Commission as to why they chose to release it again. The Bureau recognizes that these services can be used for a wide range of permitted and socially beneficial purposes, including emergency communications and speech that is protected under the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, the Commission said. Amateur and personal radio services, however, may not be used to commit or facilitate crimes. As it did in advisories in 2021, the Enforcement Bureau is reminding amateur licensees that they may not transmit communications intended to facilitate a criminal act or messages encoded for the purpose of obstructing their meaning. Likewise, individuals operating radios in the personal radio services, a category that includes citizens' band radios, family radio service walkie-talkies, and general mobile radio service, are prohibited from using those radios in connection with any activity which is against federal, state, or local law. Individuals using radios in the amateur or personal radio services in this manner may be subject to severe penalties, including significant fines, seizure of the offending equipment, and, in some cases, criminal prosecution. To report a crime, contact your local law enforcement office or the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FCC advised. The ARL Board of Directors held their regularly scheduled meeting at the end of January. And here with all the results is Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from Ellsworth, Maine. The ARRL Board of Directors met in Windsor, Connecticut, January 21st and 22nd, and re-elected President Rick Roderick K5UR for a fourth term. He's been in office since 2016. One new face will be among the officers at the next ARRL Board of Directors meeting in July. The board elected John Sager, WJ7S of Utah, to succeed Treasurer Rick Niswander, K7GM, on May 1st. Niswander had previously shared his decision to step down, having completed more than 10 years of distinguished service in the volunteer position. His most recent two-year term as treasurer expired in January. The board re-elected him to continue to serve through April 30th, allowing a transition between Niswander and treasurer-elect Sager. These remaining officers were re-elected. First Vice President Mike Raisbeck, K1TWF. Second Vice President Bob Valio, W6RGG. International Affairs Vice President Rod Stafford, W6ROD. Chief Executive Officer David Minster, NA2AA. And Chief Financial Officer Diane Middleton, W2DLM. Two new members will fill openings on the ARRL Board of Directors Executive Committee, which acts in the board's stead between scheduled board meetings elected as new EC members, were Dakota Division Director Bill Lippert, AC0W, and Pacific Division Director Kristen McIntyre, K6WX. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The Executive Committee consists of the President, five directors selected by the Board of Directors for one-year terms, the first Vice President and the Chief Executive Officer. With all positions now filled, the Executive Committee members are President Rick Roderick, K5UR, who chairs the EC, first Vice President Michael N. Raisback, K1TWF, Atlantic Division Director Tom Abernethy, W3TOM, Dakota Division Bill Lippert, ACOW, Pacific Division Director Kirsten McIntyre, 
K6WX. West Division Director John Robert Stratton, N5AUS. Great Lakes Division Director Dale Williams, WA8EFK. Chief Executive Officer David Minster, NA2AA. Minutes from the meeting have been posted on PDF format at the ARRL website. According to the Bangor Daily Newspaper, the largest United States county east of the Mississippi River is about to get its first digital amateur radio emergency service to be affiliated with the county. There's a lot of ground to cover in Aroostook County, Maine, which at more than 6,600 square miles has a lot going on when disaster strikes. A group of amateur radio operators calling themselves the Caribou Emergency Amateur Radio Service are now working to establish formal emergency communication structure in that rural county with DSTAR. The idea is to connect hams with one another as well as local and state agencies using that digital voice mode. Emergency response is already provided from the Aroostook Amateur Radio Association and Aries, but Caribou's response will primarily come alongside those of county agencies using DSTAR. Caribou announced on its Facebook page earlier this month that it's working to establish the first DSTAR repeater in northern Maine. Meanwhile, T.H. Merritt, KM4TJI, the group's president and co-founder, told a Bangor, Maine newspaper that the group has already met with local fire, police, and emergency medical services. He said that the Caribou Group is being created based on his experience as an emergency radio operator in Florida and already has a membership of 17. That is expected to grow as more people sign up and begin studying for their ham radio licenses. After all the COVID travel issues, the Rebel DX Group are finally pushing some plans forward, and they say that some information will be published shortly. They're currently looking for one or two accomplished Morse code operators who would be willing to travel at very short notice, and which may also mean living in quarantine for two weeks prior to commencing travel. The de-expedition that the Rebel DX Group have in mind involves two destinations and will be a lifetime opportunity for the individuals selected. The basic requirements stipulated for any participant are being available for two months plus COVID isolation and travelling time, being in good health, being someone who can remain stress and panic free and will not have any family dramas, and being someone who does not suffer from altitude sickness. This is because there will be several cargo loading and reloading operations using cranes and helicopters. If you think you fit the bill, you can contact the Rebel DX Group by going to their Facebook page, www.facebook.com forward slash Rebel DX Group. While many ham radio show visitors come for the flea market and a chance to chat with various vendors, at least a few come to display new technology of the sort that will become mainstream in the amateur radio community going forward. With more details on the latest technology that was shown off at the just-concluded Orlando Hamcation, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from Ellsworth, Maine. Michelle Thompson, W5NYV, the CEO of Open Research Institute, attended Orlando Hamcation, also the 2022 ARRL National Convention, on February 10th through the 13th, to promote the breadth of projects from ORI. She says the door is always open for additional participants. Visitors to the ORI booth were treated to an update on ORI's successful DVB S2X digital satellite television standard modem work and progress on the end-to-end -end demonstration of the entire satellite transponder chain. At Open Research Institute, she said, it doesn't work until it works over the air. The Phase 4 digital multiplexing transceiver satellite project is on budget, on track, and highly likely to succeed, she said. The return on investment is high. The M17 project booth, right next door to ORIs, represented the future of amateur radio, Thompson said. M17 is developing a new digital amateur radio protocol for data and voice. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Ed Wilson, N2XDD, and Steve Miller, KC1AWV, from M17 brought working hardware, firmware updates, and also demonstrated several different software implementations throughout the weekend, she said. M17 held their weekly net on Friday, live from the booth, gave away stickers, magnets, and pins, and captured the hearts of all who visited. 
Ambasat 1, Respin, was another frequent topic of conversation, said Thompson. The project is a crowdsourced low-Earth orbit satellite program. Ambasat 1 is a tiny space satellite kit that you assemble and code yourself. The five Ambasat boards from ORI, which operate at 70 centimeters, have been distributed to the firmware team and they have begun development and are seeing success in university and hobbyist labs, she reported. The goal is to create a compelling application, put the hardware on a sounding rocket, apply for a launch license, and send this project into space in a way that makes the amateur community proud. Thompson was also among the presenters participating in the ARRL Technology Academy, which was one of four all-day workshops organized for the ARRL National Convention Program held on February 10th. Her talk on digital communications technology was met by a positive, enthusiastic, and engaged audience and she hopes that ARRL will continue sponsoring similar events. She invited M17 principals to speak about their work and opened the floor for questions and comments from the many highly competent and curious technical hams that were in attendance. Subjects covered ranged from asynchronous computing to concatenated coding. Thompson recognized ARRL for its attention on amateur satellites throughout the convention. ARRL set the pace this year for satellite talks and satellite demonstrations, with a video providing practical examples of amateur satellite operations, she said. In the video, ARRL members Tom Gaines Jr., KB5FHK, and Sloan Davis, N3UPS, led viewers through making an amateur satellite radio contact from the fairgrounds parking lot. One of their satellite contacts was Patrick Stoddard, WD9EWK, who gave a tutorial on amateur satellite operations in the ARRL Hands-On Handbook Workshop. Thompson said ORI is looking forward to returning to in-person events such as the well-attended DEF CON in August. The next virtual event for ORI will be the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo, March 12th and 13th. We will have a wide variety of work and projects represented at our booth, she said. The Erie Times News reports on the case of an amateur radio operator, Richard L. Wagner, N3BWG, age 61, of Erie, Pennsylvania. He's been accused of making bogus weather emergency reports, including reports for tornadoes and bomb threats on ham radio over several months in 2021. Detectives wrote in the affidavit filed with the complaint that when Wagner was confronted by other radio operators to cease and desist, the defendant interferes in communications by playing touch tones, threatening to smash the knees of members with a baseball bat, and threatening to place a bomb in the stairwell of an eerie apartment building where he lives. County detectives accuse Wagner of transmitting bomb threats over ham radio while using a computer synthesizer to disguise his voice. The defendant has threatened to place bombs in buildings which include the City of Erie Police Department, the Erie County Courthouse, several residential housing units throughout the county, and a local eatery, detectives wrote in the affidavit. Detectives also wrote that Wagner threatened to send a pipe bomb in the mail to a resident of Erie County. The victim notified the U.S. Postal Inspection Service, which county detectives assisted in making contact with Wagner at his residence on February 1st, according to the affidavit. Investigators said Wagner denied making the pipe bomb threat. Detectives also wrote that Wagner commented on how in the past he assisted a private company in developing and writing a software program for a radio transmitter or repeater and stated his amateur radio call sign. Erie County detectives charged that Wagner aired the false weather emergency reports and the bomb threats via the Erie Radio Association transmitter or transmitters. The transmitters are used by the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency and Erie County Emergency Management in the event of regional, state, or national emergencies. Wagner was in the Erie County Prison on a $250,000 bond after Erie 5th Ward District Judge Paul Bazzaro arraigned him on charges including 11 first-degree misdemeanor counts for each of the bomb threats and each terroristic threat. 
We will keep an eye on this story and bring you updates as they become available. The Montgomery Amateur Radio Club in Maryland is offering a free online Zoom amateur radio technician license class on seven Saturdays from March 19th, 2022 through April 30th, 2022 from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. with an outdoor free test session on Sunday, May 1st, 2022 from 8.30 a.m. to 11 a.m. More information about this Zoom class can be found at www marcclub.org That's www.markclub.org And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. You got Leo right now. Your personal tech guy. Let's see, what happened this week? I'm waiting for the I'm waiting for the announcement to hit and I'm waiting for the wave of disgruntlement when uh, people realize that you will not be able to use Windows 11 without having a Microsoft account and without signing in online, which really raises some interesting questions. It's the only desktop operating system. Linux doesn't do it. Even Apple with Mac OS will allow you to create a local account and not sign into the Internet. It's the only desktop operating system I know of that you have to sign into the Internet. Now, this is true on our phones. We're used to that. I understand. You have to sign in because you can't really use a phone without connecting it to a network of some kind. But up till now, you could use a computer without connecting to a network. Like the home edition of Windows 11, the Pro edition will now require an internet connection and a Microsoft account during setup. Now, there are, I think, kind of hacky workarounds. I wouldn't recommend them, but I think they're out there. Not the easy one that used to be. You could just unplug the internet. And it would see that you didn't have the internet and say, okay, fine, fine. Just log in. Okay, create a, just create a local account. Okay, not anymore. It's going to say you have to log, you have to connect to the internet, which seems odd to me that you would, I, I mean, it's, it is the case. A computer without the internet is kind of like a fish without a bicycle. I mean, it needs, they, they, they go together, but at the same time, there are people who don't want to go on the internet or want to go on the internet, but do so uh, anonymously, privately. Not anymore. So the best advice, I guess, from the experts is create a dummy Microsoft account, set up your Windows online, and then create a local account and then just, you know, sign out of the Microsoft account. Don't throw it away. You'll still need it someday. Now, this is not yet in the public build, so uh, I may be, I may be uh, premature. Maybe a Microsoft will hear us going, what? And change their mind. It's possible. It could happen. It does happen. We'll see. One thing I would like to tell those of you who are interested in Macintosh, as I know that's a small number, but those of you who are, see, I covered Windows, not cover Mac. I'll have Linux news next. No, I won't. Uh, well, maybe I'll, I'll look. Those of you who use Macs or are waiting for a Mac should know. There's the M1 chip and the M2 chip, and you might reasonably say, well, the M2 chip is, is better, right? It's one better. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's, this is going to be a little confusing. I'm, I'm hoping Apple will adopt some other nomenclature to make this clear. The M2 chip is, yes, a newer chip based on the chip in the iPhone 13, the A15 chip, but it will be the low-end version of that chip, which will be slower than the high-end version of the M1. So the pros will want the M1 Pro or the M1 Max. Or what I'm hoping, and I doubt this will happen, I'm hoping they'll introduce a third variety of the M1. There's the Pro, there's the uh, M1 Pro, the M1 Max. We need a third one, like Super Max. I don't know. Some some third, high, even higher end. Or what they'll do is put multiple M1 Maxes or something in this Mini. Anyway... Actually, the rumor I saw said there will just be an M1 Pro in the Mini. But that's still faster than the M2, if that makes any sense at all. The M2 is initially just as the M1 was for the low end. I'm going to stop right here. This is just, I'm digging a deeper and deeper hole. When it comes out, I'll explain it. NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, is about ready to legalize something they have in France Something they have in Japan, what could it be? They've had it for nearly two decades in Europe and Japan. Adaptive headlights. Apparently, the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards only allow for high and low beam headlights 
you know, pointed straight ahead. But uh, we have some pretty cool new technology. Audi built it into one of their, I saw it at uh, CES two years ago, that uh, is very cool. The adaptive beams use a, like a projectors and uh, they can be shape the beam. So as you're going around a curve, they can, they can lead you around the curve. They could put a line on the road. Uh, they can stay bright without, but leave a little hole for the oncoming driver so that you don't blind them, but you don't have to turn down your high beams. <gasps> Ooh. Ooh, we're catching up. I was very impressed with it, the e-tron. The e-tron actually projected like uh, the line uh, on the road ahead, kind of, so you could see where you were. It was very cool. Takes a while. Toyota petitioned NHTSA in 2013, nine years ago. That's when they began the, according to Ars Technica, laborious and lengthy federal government rulemaking. I guess we don't want to rush into these things, right? You know, so I understand. Volkswagen in 2016 applied for an exemption. 2017, BMW did. NHTSA didn't do nothing <laughs> except deny it. <laughs> but now, I think Tuesday... They'll, they'll announce. So your next car might have smart headlights instead of the same old dumb ones. Finally, good news from uh, Google. They're going to follow Apple's lead and, and add uh, privacy to your Android phone. That's good. Apple, according to Facebook, is costing Facebook $10 billion on Mike next year because they won't let Facebook track you on the iPhone. Well, get ready, Facebook, because Google ain't going to do it either. Today, they said, we're announcing a multi-year initiative. Oh, that's a bad sign. Multi-year? <laughs> why don't you just turn it on now? To build the privacy sandbox on Android. With the goal of introducing new, more private advertising solutions. Limit sharing of user data with third parties. I like that. Check. Operate without cross-app identifiers. Check. We'll see when they turn that on. Multi-year sounds like maybe 2025. I don't know when that is. <laughs> anyway, let's. This is good. This is good. We encourage Google to do this, just like Apple did. And if it costs Facebook a little bit, so they can afford it. The estimate is that that just the rebranding from Facebook to Meta alone cost them five hundred million dollars, half a billion dollars, just to change the name. They can afford it. Uh, let's see what else can we talk about. It's it was it just a matter of time. Before somebody created, and of course it was the French that did it, a cheese detector. You drag the image of a French cheese. You can try it. C-H-E-E-Z-A-M dot F-R. F-R is for France. Cheese-am, it's called it. Like It's like Shazam for cheese. That's, you know, that's the elevator pitch. So we got this idea. We just need some funding. We want to make a Shazam for cheese. Here's what it says. Cheese Am. This is technology, man. This is, I mean, how did we ever survive without it? Have your iOS or Android phone ready. Go to cheeseam.fr. Take a photo, a picture of the cheese. Test the results. And uh, it'll even recommend wine pairings. <laughs> oh, you have a brie. It's too young. Do not eat it. But if you will, too, a nice uh, Beaujolais would be good. It's machine learning. So, you see, AI is taking your job. If you're a cheese detector, uh, AI built uh, by training on a data set of French cheeses. Don't try Swiss. No cheddar. No Limburger. It can only predict, this is what they say, the type of cheese. Future iterations will be built if there is demand. Why wouldn't there be demand? Holy cow, it's about time. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Where were you in 62? Let's take a snapshot of amateur radio over 45 years ago. In January 1962, there was one word on the lips of every amateur, Oscar. No, I'm not talking about the Academy Award, but rather orbital satellite carrying amateur radio. 
Oscar One was launched on December 12, 1961. By today's standards, it was extremely simple. A one cubic foot package containing a two transistor, 140 milliwatt crystal controlled CW transmitter sending high on 144.98 megacycles. The beacon lasted only three weeks, long enough for thousands of hams to hear it. Amateur radio was now in the space age. Congratulations came in from Vice President Lyndon Johnson and Mrs. Lee DeForest, the widow of the famous inventor. Oscar I was followed in June 1962 by Oscar II. Other notable 1962 space activities included John Glenn's first flight in February and the launching of Telstar, the first communication satellite in the summer. The amateur radio population hit two milestones in 1962. The number of hams passed the 250,000 mark by the end of the year, and membership in the American Radio Relay League hit 100,000. With the increase in the amateur census, the FCC was running out of WA prefix call signs in the second and sixth call areas. Soon, WB call signs would appear. As for the ARRL, it was running out of space. The old building in West Hartford was filled to the rafters. So, the ARRL proposed a new headquarters at the site of W1AW, 225 Main Street, Newington, Connecticut. The new building would cover 25,000 square feet versus 14,000 square feet for the West Hartford location. To finance the $250,000 cost, the ARRL started the building fund. They hoped to be in the new headquarters by 1963. On May 11, 1962, Herbert Hoover Jr., W6ZH, was elected president of the ARRL. Son of Herbert Hoover, the former president and secretary of commerce, W6ZH was famous in his own right as an inventor, corporate president, and engineer. Licensed since 1915, he was active on all bands from 160 through 2 meters. In regards to licenses, there was good news and bad news. The FCC decided in 1962 that an individual seeking an amateur or CB license no longer needed to have the application notarized. No longer would you solemnly stand before a notary public, right hand raised, and swear that the application was accurate and complete to the best of your knowledge. Given the sorry state of some CB and ham frequencies, I, as a notary, believe this requirement should be brought back. The bad news from the FCC? License fees. Public comment was solicited on the FCC proposal to institute license fees of between $5 and $10. The ARRL was strongly opposed to the idea. For technicians, 1962 was not a good year. A proposal to amend Part 12 to allow technicians on 10 meters was denied by the FCC. The FCC strongly reinforced their policy that the purpose of this license was experimentation, not communication. The license was not designated for communication service and was not to be regarded as a stepping stone between the novice and general classes. The ARRL supported the FCC decision. There was one bit of good news for technicians, a new magazine called VHF Horizons. The focus of this publication was ham radio above 50 megacycles, and for the first time in the amateur community, there were editorials in a national magazine supporting technicians as full-fledged hams. Unfortunately, after only two years, VHF Horizons ceased publication. In technical areas, single sideband was passing AM as the favored voice mode. Transistors now existed that could handle 2 watts or more above 50 megacycles. As a result, many all-transistor 6-meter portable units were described in the pages of QST. For those who preferred kits or factory-built equipment over homebrewing, there were lots of choices. Heathkit had the Pawnee and the Shawnee, 2 and 6-meter transceiver kits. These were AM CW mobile units which used 15 tubes and a vibrator power supply. Clegg and Gonset also had many 2 and 6 meter rigs, including the Clegg Zeus, a 6 and 2 meter transmitter for $675. Polytronics introduced the Polycom 62, 
a dual band six and two meter transceiver for $379.50. For the HF operator, Johnson had a full Viking line, including the Invader, a 200 watt CW sideband AM transmitter for $619.50. The Ranger, a 75-watt CW, 65-watt AM transmitter for $249.50. And the Adventurer, a 50-watt CW crystal control transmitter for only $54.95. Why don't you match your Viking transmitter with a Hammerlin receiver? Try the HQ-180 for $429 or the HQ-170 for $379. By the way... Radio Shack carries the full line of Hammerlin equipment at their eight stores coast to coast. Note that these are 1962 prices. Multiply them by five to get today's equivalent. Adjusted for inflation, today's radios are three times cheaper than those of the 50s and 60s. CB radio was booming in 1962. There were more CBers than hams and an ugly rumor started that the FCC was going to give 10 meters to the CB crowd. The FCC put out an announcement that the rumor was 100% false. CB radios were everywhere, even in the pages of QST, tucked away in the full-page ads from Ico and Lafayette. The national calling and emergency frequencies in 1962 were 3.55, 7.1, 14.05, 21.05, and 28.1 megacycles for CW, and 3.875, 7.25, 14.225, 21.4, 29.64, 50.55, and 145.35 megacycles for phone. And finally, Connell Rad was still alive at the beginning of 1962. Every ham had a monitor 640 or 1240 kilocycles while on the air. However, the basis for Connell Rad was becoming obsolete, and on July 13, 1962, Connell Rad ended. It was replaced by the emergency broadcast system. In our next installment, we are going to look at Connell Rad and the role it played in the lives of every amateur, sea beer, and U.S. citizen. So until then, keep monitoring 640 and 1240 kilocycles, and remember to duck and cover. I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY. Amateur Radio on the International Space Station is accepting applications until March 31st from U.S. schools, museums, science centers, and community youth organizations working individually or together, interested in hosting contacts with the International Space Station crew members, Contacts will be scheduled between January 1st and June 30th of 2023. Proposal information and additional details are available on the ARISS-USA website. ARIS is looking for organizations capable of attracting large numbers of participants and integrating the contact into a well-developed education plan. ARIS contacts afford participants the opportunity to learn firsthand from astronauts what it's like to live and work in space. The program's goal is to inspire students to pursue interests and careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Students can learn about satellite communications, wireless technology, scientific research on the ISS, radio science, and related topics. They'll also learn how to use amateur radio to talk directly to an ISS crew member. Contacts are approximately 10 minutes long. Air ISS will help educational organizations to locate amateur radio groups that can assist contact hosts with equipment and operational support. Because of the nature of human spaceflight and the complexity of scheduling activities aboard the ISS, host schools and organizations must demonstrate flexibility to accommodate changes in dates and times. An Air ISS introductory webinar will be held on March 4th at 0100 UTC, the evening of March 3rd in North American time zones. Registration is required. You can direct any questions you have to ARISS-USA. Ham radio operators can be pretty selective about their gear. Some are old-school vacuum tube purists who would never think of touching a rig containing transistors, and others are perfectly happy with small software-defined radios hooked up to their computer.
The vast majority of us, though, are somewhere in between. We appreciate the classic look and feel of vintage radios, as well as the convenience of modern ones. Better yet, some of us even like to combine the two by adding a few modern bells and whistles to our favourite old radios. Scott Baker is one such radio ham. He's only had his license for a few months now and has already jumped into some great projects, including adding what's called a pan adapter to his old Drake R4B receiver. What's a pan adapter, you may ask? As Scott explains in an excellent write-up and video, a pan adapter is a circuit that grabs a wideband signal from a radio receiver that typically has a narrowband output. The idea is that rather than just listen to a single transmission in the 40 meter band, you can view and listen a huge swathe of the spectrum, covering potentially hundreds of transmissions all at the same time. Viewing the spectrum is done via a waterfall screen, which shows the transmissions against time on a continually moving display. Seek out this story on the Southgate Amateur Radio News website, and there's a link there to Scott's very thorough background documentation. And if you read the story on hackaday.com, you'll find a link to Scott's YouTube video, which describes the system with demonstrations. Foundations of Amateur Radio one of the topics I've been talking about lately is the idea that we might be able to measure the performance of your radio in some meaningful way, using equipment that can be either obtained by any amateur, or by introducing a process that allows results to be compared, even if they have been generated differently. Recently, I came up with a tool that automatically generates a spectrogram of an audio recording. That on its own isn't particularly interesting, but it's step one in the processing of an audio signal. In addition to the spectrogram, I also created a tool that generates a tone frequency sweep. Think of it as a tone that changes frequency over time. Let's call it a sweep. If you combine the two, you can generate a spectrogram of the sweep to give you a starting point or baseline for comparison. You can build on that by using your radio to transmit that sweep and record the result using a receiver. In my initial experiments, I used an RTL SDR dongle to receive the audio with some success and a boatload of spectacular harmonics, but I wanted to find a better, more accessible way to do this, and during the week I realised that my Yesu FT857D that's sitting in my shack is connected to a perfectly functional antenna, and with a few settings it could do the job perfectly. One of the biggest issues with my RTL SDR setup was squelch, that is the difference between what is a legitimate transmission and what is noise. Set it too high and you hear nothing. Set it too low and you hear everything, including background noise. Since the VHF or 2 meter noise levels are quite high at my location, or QTH, I normally have the squelch completely closed. This is fine if you're normally using a strong repeater, but if you're attempting to receive a weak handheld, that's never going to work. As any self-respecting amateur, I was dragged down the path of last resort to read my user manual, where I discovered that in addition to CTCSS, a way to transmit a tone to open a repeater, there's also a setting called Tone Squelch, or on my radio, TSQ, which will keep my radio squelch closed unless it hears the CTCSS tone from another radio. Truth be told, I had to read a different user manual to discover how to actually set the CTCSS tone on my handheld to test. But that's just adding insult to injury. It has been a while since I read any manual, even though I try to get to it once a year or so. I blame it on the lack of field day camping. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So, combining all this, the spectrogram generator, the sweep, CTCSS, and adding a Raspberry Pi with some website magic, if you're interested, an AWS S3 bucket, I now have a service that listens on a local frequency, opens the squelch if it hears the correct CTCSS tone, records the incoming signal until it stops, then generates a spectrogram from that audio and uploads it to a website. None of this is particularly complicated, though I did have some bugs to work through. I've published the code as a branch to my existing frequency response project on GitHub, and I've asked my local community to experiment with what I have on air before I start doing more far-reaching experiments. For example, if I were to tune my radio to a local repeater output frequency, rather than the simplex one I'm currently on, I'd be able to record and generate spectrograms for each transmission coming from that repeater. If that repeater was connected to the internet, using Allstar, ILP, Echolink, DMR or Brandmeister, or even all of them, the global community could send their audio to my recorder, and it could generate a spectrogram on the spot. 
If using that repeater you played a sweep into your microphone or used your digital audio interface to play the sound, you could then compare your signal path against others and against the baseline response. One of the issues with doing this is that much of the audio that travels across the internet is pretty munched. That is, it's compressed, frequencies are cut off, there's all manner of interesting harmonics, and the value of the comparison appears limited at best. Once I have my multiband HF antenna, which I'm told is still being built, I intend to set this contraption up on HF, where we can do point-to-point -point recordings and we end up having a direct comparison between two stations who transmit into my frequency response software. I should add some disclaimers here too. At the moment I'm only using FM. The intent is to get this to a point where I can compare any mode, but when I move to HF I'll likely start with single sideband and go on from there. One other annoyance is that any user needs to configure CTCSS to make this work, which is yet another hurdle to overcome. Not insurmountable, but I like to keep things simple when you're starting to learn. Also, the harmonics still show, even on an analog radio, so there's plenty more to discover. In the meantime, what kinds of things can you think of to use this for? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports new sunspot groups appeared on February 17th, 19th, 20th, and 21st, but solar activity declined even though sunspots were seen covering the sun every day. The average daily sunspot number declined by 21 points from 75.3 last week to 54.3 in the February 17th through 23rd reporting week. Average daily solar flux was down nearly 15 points from 110.1 to 95.4. The 3Y0J Bouvet Islands de-expedition is confirmed January 6, 2023 as its date of departure on board the vessel SV Marama. The de-expedition will make the second most wanted DXCC entity available for the first time in several years. It is complex to plan the logistics of such a huge project like the 3Y0J Bouvet de-expedition, which involves many parties, the de-expedition announced this week. The new date is mainly related to the Marama vessel logistics, but also will enable us to return to Cape Town in late February 2023. The 3Y0J team also confirmed that the de-expedition will run for 44 days overall, with a contingency week for added flexibility. We have contracted 22 days at Bouvet Island, and it means we will spend more than three weeks at Bouvet, the announcement said. As we have the flexibility to still decide the port of departure, Ushuaia, Argentina, or Port Stanley Falkland Islands, this will be done at a later stage. The de-expedition will feature 12 stations with eight CW or single sideband stations and four FT8 stations. Operators aim to log at least 200,000 contacts. We'll be using the Elecraft K3S, a well-proven in-the-field de-expedition radio as the CW and single sideband radio, and the Sun SDR2DX as the FT8 radio, the de-expedition said. We want to emphasize that the FT8 radios will not be run in unattended robot mode, the de-expedition said. Each FT8 QSO will be initiated by a human operator sitting at Cape Phi on Bouvet. During peak times, we will run up to 12 radios simultaneously. We plan for minimum downtime on the radios, and to achieve this, we will set up the four FT8 stations to run 24-7, so that these can either be run by one operator separately, or be run by any other operator in a simplified SO2R setup. This will be done so that each operator can log into the FT8 machine from his operator position and run CW, single sideband, and FT8 simultaneously. Running several radios by a single operator this way has shown to be very efficient. Stations will be equipped with various 1.5 kilowatt amplifiers, 2 kilowatts PEP for 160 meters. The receive antenna will be a ground independent receive loop system developed by LZ1AQ. It will be located some 300 meters from the camp for use on 160 through 30 meters with the capability to feed up to six receivers. It also permits switching from loop to dipole mode. Five diesel generators will power 3Y0J with one spare. The D Expedition's co leaders are Ken Opskar. LA7GIA, Rune Uy, LA7THA, and Aaron Marin, LB1QI. Keep up with the D-Expedition's plans and preparations via the 3Y0J website and the 3Y0J Facebook page. Individuals may support the D-Expedition via the 3Y0J website. Time now for the AMSAT report. 
Spain's IARU member society URE is readying Eurosat for launch in October 22. It will be based on the architecture of Genesis, ESAT2, and Hades, but with a 32-bit computer. It will include a VU-FM repeater with FSK frames allowing voice contacts and digipeating of AX25 and APRS frame. URE is still selecting some additional payloads, but one that will be on board is the ability to play chess against the onboard computer. Moves will be sent using FSK frames from which the computer will answer in telemetry. Thanks to Southgate Amateur Radio News for this story. Happy fifth birthday to Naif One or EO88 launched in February 15th, 2017 and still going. Check it out if you have not had the opportunity to use it. The uplink is 435.015 to 435.045 megahertz upper side band. The downlink is 145.96 to 145.99 megahertz lower side band with an inverting transponder. The AMSAT report comes to us each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. Matt's Romeo Mike 2 Delta will be active as Juliet Tango 4 Romeo Romeo from the South Gobi region of Mongolia between March the 20th and April the 5th. He also mentions that sometime in March or April and July or August, he's planning a few days of portable activity as Juliet Tango 4 Romeo Romeo Portable from the South Gobi Desert itself. He says that this will not be a regular de-expedition, but rather a bit of extreme portable operation, using a Lab 599 TX500 heavy-duty low-power transceiver with 5 to 10 watts, and a vertical antenna with three elevated resonant radials on a DX wire mini glass fibre pole. He may be able to use a 50-watt amplifier, provided that he can find a suitable battery power source. Activity will be every 14 days, which is his day off work at the OU Tolgoi Copper and Gold Mine. After a month, he may be able to undertake activities once per week. The most likely days of operation will be Sundays, but when his working roster swings round, Thursdays may be alternative days. He'll be working for 10 weeks on site in South Gobi and then gets 5 weeks back home in Russia. That is how the working pattern is looking now. Normally, rosters are four weeks on and two weeks off, but the need for COVID isolation has caused changes which make the duty cycles much longer. Matts advises that his QSL manager will be Pedro Echo Alpha 5 Golf Lima, and Logbook of the World will also be used. The upcoming solo Crozet Island de-expedition spearheaded by Thierry Mazel, F6CUK, will likely arrive on the island around Christmas. While traveling aboard the Marion du France, Mazel will make stopovers at other remote islands that are also rare DXCC entities, including Tromelin Island. The Crozet and Tromelin Islands are administered as part of the French Southern and Antarctic Lands, abbreviated in French as TAAF. After the permission granted by the TAAF and the de-expedition announcement, the time has come to gather the equipment and move forward with the preparations, Mazel said. The Marion de Fres will leave Reunion Island on December 8th with a stopover at Tromelin to resupply the people there, then head for Crozet. Mazel expects to spend a solid three months operating from the Alfred Faure base on Crozet. The Marion de Fres will return on March 26, 2023, after stopovers at the Kerguelen Islands and Amsterdam, arriving at Reunion Island on April 16, 2023. He says dates may vary depending upon weather conditions. His first task upon arrival will be to erect antennas and set up his station, for which he'll need to enlist help from others. He'll also have to contend with the weather, as Crozet is subject to strong winds. No call sign has been issued at this point, although Mazel has requested one that will commemorate the 60th anniversary of the first amateur operation from Crozet in 1961 and 1962. To head off problems with pirates, the call sign won't be released until after Mazel has arrived on Crozet and just hours before he begins operation. Paul Granger, F6EXV, and Jean-Michel Duthilieu, 
F6AJA will spread the word once that happens. Mazel had hoped to use an Elecraft K3 transceiver, but will use a pair of Kenwood TS590 transceivers instead. He settled on 500 watt ACOM 1010 tube amplifiers. I have asked the TAAF for permission to send part of the equipment with the previous ship supply mission leaving in November, Mazel said. It sometimes happens that, because of the weather during the landing, not everything can be brought to the island. Imagine being on the island without a station. Mazel said much remains to be done, including finalizing antenna designs, securing winter clothing, and organizing scheduled contacts with school children via the QO100 geostationary satellite. Crozet will be an all-time new one for many, and you can't afford missing it as nobody knows when the next ham operation will take place from this number three most needed, Mazel said in urging contributions to the de-expedition effort. The last ham radio activity from Crozet was in 2009 by Florentine Bard, F4DYW, who operated as FT5WQ. The 2022 and 2023 solo de expedition is anticipated to cost upwards of $60,000. For additional information, visit the Crozet Island de expedition website. The DX Adventure team has provided the following update about their forthcoming DX expedition to Svalbard in the South Atlantic using call signs Juliet Whiskey Zero X Ray and Juliet Whiskey 1000 Quebec Oscar, which is due to take place between April the 19th and the 26th, 2022. In a press release, the team said that DX Adventure is a joint venture between Max, Oscar November 5 Uniform Romeo, and Eric, Oscar November 4 Alpha November November, and consists of 15 very enthusiastic people with a lot of experience in participating or organising DX expeditions. This first DX Adventure project is therefore immediately ambitious. The Arctic Archipelago of Svalbard Island, which is Islands on the Air reference Echo Uniform 026. The setup is to be active with five stations, all on HF bands in different modes. More CW, single sideband, radio teleprinter and the digital modes FT8 and FT4. In addition, the team has the ambition to be the first to activate Echo Uniform 026 on the amateur satellite QO100, where they will use the call sign Juliet Whiskey 1000 Quebec Oscar. Three team members will take up the challenge of driving a snowmobile all the way to Capalina, about 100 kilometers east of the capital Longyearbyen. This is the only location on the archipelago that allows line of sight to the QO100 satellite. In addition, Capalina is also on the edge of the satellite footprint, so it's going to be a challenge. You can read all about the de-expedition at www.dx-adventure.com. And every financial contribution is welcome and appreciated. With the donation of at least 25 euros, you have a chance to win one of the 10 JW0X flags. With a donation of 50 euros, you will receive a beautiful JW0X scarf, a nice souvenir that shouldn't be missing from the shack. And the team's motto? Well, it's you hear our signals and we feel the pileup. ARRL Life member Courtney Duncan, N5BF, will be the keynote speaker for the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo on Saturday, March 12th in the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo Auditorium. With more details on what the upcoming QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo has to offer, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this special report. The semi-annual virtual ham radio gathering will be live March 12th and 13th. Tickets are now on sale at www.qsotodayhamexpo, all one word, dot com. Duncan will discuss the importance of amateur radio and technical hobbies in advancing global technology. This edition of the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo will showcase a wide range of topics with appeal to newcomers and veterans alike. It's a chance to update your amateur radio knowledge and get exposed to cutting-edge ham radio technology 
as well as to practical operating and building techniques. Like a live ham radio convention or ham fest, the expo has presentations, exhibits, and state-of-the-art lounges for face-to-face -face interaction among participants. Some 60 ham radio luminaries will address a multitude of topics during the virtual event from de-expeditions to Solar Cycle 25. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Just retired from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Courtney Duncan, N5BF, supported numerous missions involving digital and radio frequency hardware and software, most recently as telecommunications lead for the Ingenuity Mars helicopter. Some highlights of the upcoming HAM Expo seminars will include Mike Crownover, AB5EB, Erwin Marion, LB1QI, and Bill Straw, KO7SS, will discuss their plans to operate from Bouvet Island in November 2022. ARRL Central Division Director and ARRL Electromagnetic Compatibility Committee Chair, Carl Lutzelschwab, K9LA, will present an update on Solar Cycle 25. Chasing DX during a contest is the subject of a presentation by Bill Salyers, AJHB. He'll offer best practices, tools, and techniques to increase your chances of logging DX during operating events. Because it's a virtual event, you don't have to pick and choose which presentations you can attend. You can watch any one of them within 30 days of the expo, as well as explore exhibitor offerings from the comfort of your computer or other device. ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, is a QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo partner. Tickets include entry for the live two-day event and the 30-day on-demand period. In the United States, North and South Carolina are teaming up for a two QSO party weekend. On Saturday, February 26th, hams in South Carolina's 46 counties will be chasing contacts. There's a new category for hams operating portable from temporary stations activating in one or more counties. Expedition stations may move from county to county. And then on Sunday, February 27th, it's North Carolina's turn and hams will be chasing contacts in that state's 100 counties. There are bonus points for working the NC4QP bonus station as well as the call signs N4D, N4U, N4K, and N4E, all the stations having suffixes that spell Duke in honor of Duke University, the pride of North Carolina. Meanwhile, we say congratulations to the organizers of the Voice of America 80th Anniversary Special Event Station. Operators logged 3,665 QSOs at stations W3V, W8O, and W4A, according to Jocelyn Brault, KD8VRX slash VA2VRX of the Westchester Amateur Radio Association. He said that all digital cards have been sent and certificates will be emailed shortly. Paper QSLs are expected to be sent out sometime in March. Seminar videos from Ham Radio University are now available on YouTube. Held on January 8th as a virtual conference, Ham Radio University may be over, but it's not gone. Videos of the day-long event have been uploaded to YouTube, where any number of workshops are available for viewing. Whether you couldn't attend HRU or weren't able to get all the workshops you wanted, the Ham Radio University YouTube channel makes it easy to see what you missed. In addition to the introductory classes for DXing and the basics of HF operating, presenters also cover contesting, the various logging programs out there, parks on the air, the digital HF modes, and QRP operations, as well as several other topics covered in the videos, an assortment of workshops from previous years complete the channel. Ham Radio University played host to the ARRL New York City and Long Island Section Convention. The Wireless Institute of Australia News Service reports on the tragic conclusion to a missing person story, which they first brought to light several years ago. The bodies of an amateur radio operator and his companion have now been positively identified. Russell Hill, Victor Kilo 3, Victor Zulu Papa and Carol Clay disappeared two years ago in the Victorian bushland where the two had gone camping. 
The last message heard from Russell was on March the 20th of 2020, when he made a contact on one of the HF bands, reporting his location at Wanangatta Valley in the Victorian Alps. No one heard from them again. One day later, campers discovered the radio operator's vehicle and the couple's campsite destroyed by fire. Forensic testing has now confirmed the identity of remains found last November as those of the radio ham and his friend. A man who had been camping nearby was arrested last November and charged with two counts of murder. The man, in his mid-fifties, is due in court in May. Victorian police have described the couple's disappearance as one of their most high-profile cases. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Every year, professional and amateur tower climbers fall to their deaths. In most cases, these accidents were avoidable. Not too long ago, people in my community were shocked when a commercial tower climber fell to his death. According to our local paper, on April 21st, Jerry Trammell, 29 years old, not an amateur, of southern Indiana, fell from an older style microwave reflector tower where he was working with another climber. They were painting the tower. There is no way to prevent all accidents. That's why they call them accidents. As a tower climber, we can reduce them by following some simple safety guidelines. No matter if you're climbing up or down, a simple climbing procedure can dramatically reduce the risk of falling. The cost for this added safety is a slower rate of climb. First off, use the proper commercial climbing belt and attachment gear. Secondly, always wear a commercial climbing shoulder harness. Join the harness to your belt. And lastly, use a similar strap from your harness and attach it to the tower, but always to a different placement on the tower from your belt. This way, no matter which one fails, the other one is more than strong enough to hold your weight and that of your gear and cargo. With a dual strap attachment, you can climb up or down with two straps and always be attached to the tower. Using this method, the only thing that can injure you is a total failure of the tower or a near direct lightning strike. This may slow your vertical movement, but ask yourself this question. If I misplace a clamp, can I flap my arms fast enough to slow my fall to a safe speed? Let's review this simple procedure one more time. You will use two climbing straps to attach to the tower. Always clamp these two straps to different places on the tower, never to the same tower part. From a standstill, unhook one strap and step up one or two rungs until the other strap is around your knees. Then clamp the first strap as high as you can reach. Now, reach down and unhook the lower strap. Step up until the now higher strap is about knee height and reach up and clamp on with the loose one. By using shoulder harness and waist belts and using this method, you will always be connected to the tower while climbing. Remember to follow the dual attachment safety rule while clamped onto the tower when you intend to let go of the tower and lean fully into your belt. Always clamp onto two different places. When using duplicate strap attachments, you effectively reduce the chances of a fatal fall by nearly half. That's a cheap and cost-effective insurance policy you can write for yourself. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. The first edition of the 5 MHz newsletter appeared in the autumn of 2011, heralding the growth of the new 60-meter band to serve as a propagation bridge between 40 and 80 meters. Here with more details on the 5 MHz newsletter is Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from Ellsworth, Maine. The 5 MHz newsletter has marked its 10th anniversary. The first edition of the 5 MHz newsletter appeared in the autumn of 2011, heralding the growth of the new 60-meter band to serve as a propagation bridge between 40 and 80 meters. 
The newsletter, edited by Paul Gaskell, G4MWO, offers official news of new allocations and regulations, as well as feedback from operators on 60 meters. As a band, the U.S. authorized a group of experimental license operators to use 60 meters, while the U.K. discussed the issue, deciding that a number of channels could be feasible. U.K. hams had five 3 kilohertz wide channels to start with. Similarly, the U.S. settled on five channels as well. Other countries followed suit, sometimes with channels, sometimes with a band, with a variety of power limits and modes. According to the newsletter, 80 five countries currently have a presence on 60 meters. In 2017, the FCC invited comments on ARRL's petition for rulemaking to allocate a new contiguous secondary band at 5 megahertz to the amateur service. The FCC has not yet acted on the ARRL petition. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. In the U.S., the federal government is the primary user of the 5 megahertz spectrum. The FCC designated ARRL's petition as RM-11785, but has not acted on it. At last report, the Malaysian Amateur Transmitters Society said its telecommunications authority, MCMC, has approved a secondary 60-meter allocation based on the World Radio Conference 15 template. Radio amateurs there were waiting for formal paperwork to be completed before they could use the band. However, MCMC granted MARTS temporary licenses that permit the use of 60 meters for emergency communication and emergency communication drills. Hardly had this been granted than it was activated, the latest edition of the 5 MHz newsletter reported. During the MARTS annual general meeting on December 18, 2021, heavy rain began to fall and MARTS activated its MARTS Disaster and Emergency Communications Center under the call sign 9M4D. A significant number of Malaysian states were flooded, communities evacuated, and telecommunications lost. The Disaster and Emergency Communications Center remained open for a number of days, carrying their own as well as third-party traffic concerning situation reports and aid requests to the National Disaster Management Agency, the newsletter said. Martz is now transmitting in whisper mode from time to time on 5364.7 kHz as 9M4BQC. The authorization is temporary. The beacon has been heard in Australia, Austria, Belgium, Canary Island, China, Denmark, France, Germany, Hawaii, Italy, Luxembourg, Manchester, Netherlands, Norway, Poland, Russia, Sweden, the UK, and in the US. Reception reports are welcomed directly via Whispernet or email. Hams in the United Kingdom have played a big role in celebrations of the BBC's centenary this year. The most recent special event station was heard on the 14th of February as radio operators in Chelmsford called QRZ at station GB100 2MT, marking the historic first transmission from the Marconi Company's Riddle Hut there. The hut is now going digital with the help of an artist who is creating a digital model of it for inclusion at the Chelmsford Museum. The artist, Sean Fan, and the museum are calling the exhibit Forecast 22, the birth of British broadcasting. The virtual 3D model will include a replica of the 2MT transmitter, as well as the contents of the building. The exhibit opens in October. If you can't get to Chelmsford to take a step inside of history, don't worry. You can take part in the Forecast 22 on your mobile phone, wherever in the world you might be. It's a different kind of digital DXing, but a fitting option for a celebration that changed the shape and sound of British broadcasting. And finally this week, amateurs in Australia are preparing for a lot of mayhem. Mayhem, the largest amateur radio gathering in the Southern Hemisphere, has an equally large and ambitious agenda for Sunday, the 1st of May. In addition to planning the usual activities, such as pedestrian and mobile fox hunts, organizers from the Central Coast Amateur Radio Club are looking for lecturers to deliver talks on a variety of subjects. Each 45-minute presentation will be followed by no more than 15 minutes of questions and answers. 
formerly known as Wyong Field Day, it has run over 60 years without a break, even through these COVID years. Mayhem is scheduled to be held at the customary location of the Wyong Racecourse. If you have a presentation you'd like to share with some of Australia's most enthusiastic radio amateurs, contact call VK2ZCO by emailing CCARC at ccarc.org.au and describe your proposed lecture. If you're looking to upgrade or even get your first license, contact the education coordinator of the club at education at ccarc.org.au. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater K2RHI on 146.940 MHz, serving the Tri-Cities of New York State's capital region from Mount Refinesk in Brunswick, New York. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you'd like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and our news team around the world, this is Chris Perrine, KB2.